this month is the 65th anniversary of the uh, UN Declaration on Human Rights, and we're going to talk about how it came to be and its uh, ongoing vitality today. And our first speaker is Alita Black. We're very honored to have her with us. She is one of America's leading authorities on Eleanor Roosevelt, a professor of history and international affairs at George Washington University. She's the founding editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers, a project designed to preserve, teach, and apply Mrs. Roosevelt's work on human rights and democracy. Her numerous publications include four books on Eleanor Roosevelt, Casting Her Own Shadow, Eleanor Roosevelt and the Shaping of Post-War Liberalism, What I Want to Leave Behind, Democracy in the Selected Articles of Eleanor Roosevelt, and Courage in a Dangerous World, the Political Writings of Eleanor Roosevelt, as well as the forthcoming ER, Eleanor Roosevelt, Politics and the Dream of Democracy. Please welcome Professor Alita Black. Hi, everybody. I guess it's appropriate that we start the conversation about the Declaration during lunch, because Eleanor Roosevelt always said the most fundamental human right was the right to food. So in some ways, there's a, a synchronicity to this. I want to thank Human Rights First for this extraordinary, extraordinary day, which for me, as a popular human rights educator um, and fantasy policymaker is like the best seminar I could imagine. But what I would really like to do today is to talk a little bit about the struggle to craft the Declaration and the stereotypes that, sh that really shroud it, and especially ending with the age-old debate of whether it's an Eastern or a Western document. But first, I just want to add, I want you to consider this stage. You're in a windowless room. It's January 1946. You've got 18 people around the table. The only thing that you have in common is that you beat the Germans and you hate the Nazis. No, I'm serious. You don't have the concept of private property in common, the concept of God, the concept of personhood. What is the purpose of government? What is a citizenship? What is marriage? What is childhood? What is nationality? What is the right to travel? What is punishment? What is civic participation? And what is work? There is no fundamental common understanding of, um, from the 18 nations that are assembled around that table debating these issues. And in fact, they are, as you all know, instructed delegates. So whenever they say something that their government does not like, they are removed from the conversation. And a new delegate is reseated in their seat at the table. And they try to force the conversation to begin all over. It takes 300 meetings that last more than 13,000 hours sitting around a table in two years, plus countless working sessions and drafting sessions, as I'm sure Habib will talk about, because his father played an integral role in that, to craft the Declaration. Now, Eleanor Roosevelt was not the architect of the Declaration, but with there is no doubt, and I can say this by looking at 253 archives in 60, in 60 uh, I'm sorry, in all 50 states and nine nations, to say that without Eleanor Roosevelt, there would not be a declaration. And to show you how unappreciated she is in the United States compared to how she is in the world, before Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, I would argue that Eleanor Roosevelt was the most famous American. And I will say that because of conversations that I've had in the favelas, in Sao Paulo, in the mountains of Kenya, in, the, in former slave tunnels in Ghana, in Brazil and in Argentina, in China, in Liberia, and in South Africa. 
to them, you know, when we talk about, as, as Kofi said, that the greatest American system is not the American military, but the Peace Corps in terms of bringing human rights, that is a quintessential Eleanor Roosevelt idea. Because Eleanor, in fact, was the person who first presented the idea to the Peace Corps, of the Peace Corps to the federal government. Way before Sergeant Shriver really crystallized it and John Kennedy funded it, Eleanor was trying to pitch it in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. Now, how does this relate to the Declaration and the battle to create the Declaration? It's quite simple. Eleanor says that it will take three years for lawyers to decide where to put a comma. What we have to have is a clearly articulated vision that will combat fear, that will give people the courage that they need to go through these countless debates over the covenant on political and civil rights, the covenant on social, economic, and political rights, which are the exact same debates that are going on in the United States today over the International Criminal Court and social and economic rights. So what she did as chair of the committee to draft the declaration was really three things. The first was to insist that this be clear and readily understandable. She said, it doesn't make any sense to sound smart if you confuse the issue. So for those people who say that it is just a Western issue, I ask them to go to the record to look at whom Eleanor Roosevelt consulted to see if the language that was drafted in the drafting committee was A, sensitive to their concerns, B, relevant to their values, and C, inspiring enough to encourage them to risk their lives to implement it. This meant not just meeting with the Secretariat staff, not just meeting with the Diplomatic Corps, but meeting with every single staffer in the United Nations at that time in Geneva and in Paris. Whether they took out the trash, whether they cooked the food, whether they drove the cars, or whether they were the legal brains in the drafting committee and the Secretariat. She also had an extensive familiarity with the religions of the world, for example, in 1938, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a book in the United States about the Quran and about the importance of the Quran and I Ching and the Baghdad Vita, as well as the basic tenets of Christianity and Catholicism and, um, and Judaism to bring people to the table to try to find core values. So the struggle for the declaration for her was jump-started by the war, but it was bred in her in response to World War I. When she was a translator for an international conference of working women from uh, the Balkans, from Russia, from South America, and immigrants to the United States who came together to try to figure out how to deal with the impact of war on family. And so what came out of this to her a woman with four years of school. I'm not talking college. I'm not talking postdoc. I'm not talking a high school diploma. I'm talking a self-educated woman with four years of school who taught herself six languages so that she could, in fact, negotiate with people around the world and journalists around the world to find common language. Because what Eleanor said about the Declaration still holds true today. She said that if we spent all our time trying to make it legally binding, it would never get out of committee. We had to do a three-pronged strategy. Write the Declaration, get the covenants adopted, and set up an international enforcement mechanism. Why? Because if you don't give people an image to counteract the horror that they have seen. Not only the Holocaust, the horror of 60 million displaced persons in Europe, 
the horror in the United States of the greatest loss of American soldiers since the Civil War, the huge upturn in social values and mores in communities that happened during the, during the American War, the incredible numbers of race riots that happened in the United States during the war. We had 263 race riots in the United States during World War II. So it wasn't always the good war. What she said was very fundamental. You can either look in the mirror and see the horrors of the past, or you can have the courage to look in the mirror, see your, see your face, and stay, take one step at a time. And so for her, the declaration and the negotiations processes were all about trying to find common language to keep people at the table and not walk away to move it forward. And in the process, she got the Soviets to, uh, to abandon their opposition to civil and political rights. And upon threatening George Marshall and John Lovett with her very public resignation, got our State Department to drop their um, opposition to social, economic, and cultural rights. Because all Eleanor says in 45 seconds is that the declaration, if embraced, will become law of the world. She's, that's, it's advancing that way, so she's prescient in that. The other thing she says is a challenge to us, which I think is the struggle, one of the struggles of human rights, which, which is when will our consciences grow so tender that we will act to prevent human misery rather than avenge it. Thank you very much. Your turn. Go get them, honey. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Black. Uh, now it's a real treat to introduce Habib Malik, a citizen of both the United States and Lebanon. He has taught and published widely on the Middle East, Lebanon, Christianity in the Arab world, human rights, regional security, democracy, and even existentialism. In 2010, the Hoover Institution at Stanford University published his book, Islamism and the Future of the Christians of the Middle East. And you're gonna hear from him uh, tomorrow on our panel on religious pluralism. He currently divides his time between teaching history, cultural studies, and political science at the Lebanese American University and researching his late father, Dr. Charles Malik's unpublished diary in his archives at the Library of Congress. Dr. Charles Malik, a Lebanese philosopher and diplomat, was, as you just heard, a central figure in the negotiation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Please welcome Dr. Habib Malik. Thank you very much, and thank you also to Human Rights Watch for Human Rights, sorry, first. <laughs> For, <laughs> for inviting me um, on this uh, 65th anniversary. Um, in that brief crack or tear in the fabric of a turbulent history, uh, a kind of narrow interlude or window between the end of the Second World War in 1945 and the start of the Cold War in 1949, a group of intrepid visionaries from a variety of countries and backgrounds led by Eleanor Roosevelt and including Rene Cassin from France, Charles Malik from Lebanon, John Humphrey from Canada, P.C. Chang from China, and a number of others, painstakingly hammered, as Alida just said in so many meetings, so many hours, hammered out what became arguably the 20th century's single leading international document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The way was paved for the work of the Human Rights Commission at the newly founded United Nations by a go-ahead that they received from a group of philosophers headed by Jacques Maritain, the neo-Thomist French philosopher, who were tasked by UNESCO at the time in 1946 with canvassing values across cultures, cultures to see any commonalities or, or overlaps that would justify embarking on a project to tabulate universal human rights. The Philosopher's Committee happily gave the green light at the end, and Maritain famously summed it up as follows, quote, 
yes, we agree about the rights, but on condition no one asks us why, end quote. So the uh, go-ahead was given to embark on this laborious task of um, uh, articulating the, common, the commonalities of values across cultures, which would eventually produce the Universal Declaration. Now, work on the preamble and various articles of the Declaration was not always smooth within the Commission, with the Soviet delegates constantly seeking to obstruct and delay progress. My late father, Charles Malik's persistent standing up to Soviet obfuscations eventually caught Eleanor Roosevelt's attention, and we have in her open support of many of Malik's positions, especially on the importance of uh, emphasizing the intermediate institutions uh, of civil society that would shield or cushion the individual from an oppressive state, we have in that perhaps the earliest shots across the ideological bow of what would later mushroom into the Cold War confrontation between human freedom on the one hand and an oppressive materialist uh, philosophy, communism. Charles Malick's many contributions included the adoption of his version of the Declaration's preamble. That was literally a back of the envelope um, uh, text that he wrote. Because Eleanor Roosevelt asked him to do so, he was shuttling at the time between, uh, he was wearing many hats between New York and, and Washington. Uh, and uh, uh, over the weekend, uh, he, he wrote what eventually became the, uh, with, with some minor stylistic modifications, the text of the preamble. The preamble is very important because it is laden with philosophical terms, like uh, terms that we have seen in, in other documents, like the uh, Declaration of Independence, in, inalienable rights, and, and, and such uh, words like that. Uh, it was adopted over the, um, uh, proposed and, and longer text by Cassin, which was very much focused on the recent horrors of the Second World War. Uh, the actual wording of Article 18, the all-important religious freedom article, are those of Charles Malik as well, in which the right of anyone to change his or her religion is explicitly stated and not just implied, and fortuitously so. Uh, that also generated some uh, issues. The Saudi Arabian delegate, uh, delegation was planning, because of that, to uh, cast a negative vote. And it was thanks to uh, Malik's um, uh, diplomatic uh, cajoling behind the scenes, aided by a, a liberal-minded Pakistani Ahmadi uh, delegate, uh, Zafrullah Khan, which persuaded the Saudis eventually to shift from a negative to an abstention. Uh, there were no negative votes at the end on December 10, which is, which is also uh, imp very important. And towards the end, when um, uh, the work of the third committee, which Charles Malik presided over in about 80 meetings, to go over every comma and every letter of the draft before the vote in the General Assembly. Uh, this was the fall of 1948. The air was thick with international tension. Had the Soviets been allowed to continue filibustering endlessly, probably that window, that very important window, would have been missed. And so Charles Malik basically, as chairman, obtained a stopwatch and imposed strictly the three-minute rule that everybody, including the Soviet delegate and the Americans and everyone, has only three minutes to speak. And then the gavel comes down, and uh, it's over. And had he not done that, probably, uh, who knows? But I mean, the, the time was pressing. Um, and uh, so he deliberately preempted, if you will, the Soviet filibuster. Um, the, un the Universal Declaration is precisely that, a declaration. It has no legally binding status, unlike the later human rights covenants of the 1960s. It only has moral force. And yet, you know, hardly anyone talks about the covenants of the 1960s. Uh, those covenants that precisely in order for them to be accepted as binding on the signatory states have to feature, have to embody many loopholes that subvert their effectiveness. Uh, the moral power of the 
declaration is attested to by the fact that so many of the groups and movements of liberation from communism in Eastern Europe uh, in the 1970s and 80s consistently hoisted the, the Universal Declaration as their banner. The anti-apartheid forces in South Africa actually did the same as well. So many countries have incorporated the Universal Declaration in their constitutions, making it binding for them. So at a time when human rights have become a global concern, but have also spawned a cottage industry of pseudo rights, questionable rights as well. I mean, everything today has become a human right, including some glaring violations. At this time of confusion, the Universal Declaration, I believe, stands as a timeless pillar of stability and an inspiring beacon for future generations to fall back upon, precisely in order to offset this kind of um, uh, confusion and perhaps abuse of rights, and I thank you. Thank you so much. And now uh, it's a special treat for me to introduce uh, our next speech speaker, Taylor Branch. Taylor Branch is one of our country's foremost historians of the civil rights movement. His monumental 2300 page trilogy, America in the King Years, earned him the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. In 2009, he published The Clinton Tapes, Wrestling History with the President, a memoir that details an unprecedented eight-year project to gather a sitting president's comprehensive oral history on tape. And this year, he published The King Years, Historic Moments in the Civil Rights Movement, a comprehensive view of America in the 1960s. Please welcome Taylor Branch. Thank you so much. I'm here to salute you all and s salute you for your work. I learned a great deal from both presentations I just heard uh, about the foundations of work in human rights uh, that in effect lifted the mandate and the optimism of the civil rights movement that came on shortly after it. It is a pregnant question whether the mandate was put into motion more the Human Declaration more by the dire conditions of World War II and the awful calamities, or by the optimism of the natural winners who survived those calamities. There's some strange mixture of human reality and op victory uh, optimism that produced that. It came on, and I grew up with it. I was actually born during those negotiations. I had nothing to do with them, um, <laughs> but I was born, and when I grew up, I remember there was a spirit of optimism. We licked polio. Uh, you know, we, we could do anything. We could go to the moon. Uh, can do America. Some of that went all around the world. Some of it seeped into the civil rights movement that I studied for so many years. The civil rights movement tackled the question of how a people who are denied basic human rights can establish them when they don't have the power to do so. It's an ancient conundrum. How do you get power without rights, and how do you get rights without power? Uh, you're stuck. You're an invisible minority with none of the traditional um, tools of power. You don't have the right to vote. You don't have publicity. You don't have economic uh, power. You don't have corporations. You don't have um, advertising. You don't have banks. You don't have publicity. And basically, the civil rights movement in its early stages folded all those functions into the black church. Um, it, mass meetings in black churches substituted for everything. Bulletin board, it, it was their congress, it was everything else. They debated basically what is an institution, what is a right. An institution, as my former teacher Hannah Arendt told me once, is what makes us sit persistently around the same table. That's what every institution is. But you have to have a right to do that, and a right is something that is established by common agreement. It's very, very profound. That's why your, your name is good. Right, human rights first, because you start with rights and everything else is a consequence. But rights go very, very deeply. And Dr. King was the only adult leader in the civil rights movement who instantly recognized the sit-ins of 1960 as not a panty raid, which is, uh, no, people didn't take young people seriously. 
Not a panty raid, but he said it was a breakthrough because there are some aspects of human nature that are so stubborn about rights that words are not enough. You have to amplify that through sacrifice. You have to amplify it through work. It takes time. It works hard. The sit-ins did that. You can't, you can't boycott someplace that excludes you. You've got to figure out a way to take nonviolence, which was the heart of the movement, through people's uh, disagreement. In that sense, he paid tribute to young people as leaders of the civil rights movement. Dr. King didn't go on the Freedom Rides. They couldn't get him to go. He was fearful of it. Not until Birmingham did he take enormous risk and leaps to test the major proposition of the civil rights movement that it could be a leadership doctrine for the essential core functions of American freedom that they distilled in hours and hours and nights and months of, of debate, which were that American freedom tests the capacity of mankind for self-government and public trust, building public trust. No one is more self-governing and has more public trust than a freedom rider who looks in the eye of a Klansman with a club about to beat them and said, I will not resist, you can beat me, but this act, I believe, will establish sooner or later some form of human contact between our descendants that will be stronger than the club in your hand. That's a tremendous sense of discipline, a tremendous sense of public trust, distilled from immersion in the founding documents of what Dr. King called equal souls and equal votes. As an orator, his gift was that he could talk about religious and, and civil underpinnings for freedom without offending either side. Very few people can do that. There's not one single instance on the public record of people attacking him for mixing church and state, although he did it every day. The reason for that is because he didn't try to subdue one with the other, which is how people get in trouble. He said, either way, equal souls or equal votes, the promise of our movement is about the power of freedom, and it tests the power of freedom and common consent to triumph over violence. That's really what your work is about. That's really what a lot, about a lot of what human rights is about. Birmingham showed when Dr. King was almost at the end of his tether and about to give up in 1963, in a supreme gamble, he allowed junior high students and even six and eight year olds to march to jail on May 2nd and 3rd, 1963. The previous day when they were only adults, they couldn't get more than 14. On May 2nd, they had 600. On May 3rd, they had 1,000. It was the photographs of little children, mostly girls, marching into dogs and fire hoses sustained the premise of the civil rights movement that in the long run, power grows against the grain of violence, not with it. That is the hardest thing for, for people, even in leadership positions, even in the United States, to believe from our own experience. We don't study violence in universities these days to the degree we should. What's the relationship between violence and power? The people that I know that study it the most and are most profound might surprise you are professional military people at the National War College who say that in the long run since Napoleon industrialized war, the main trend is that violence destroys more and governs less in an interdependent world. That is, that is a fact. That is a reasonable assertion. It's at the heart of not only most religious belief, but it's at, of course at the heart of the Constitution. Dr. King always said, what is democracy but a system of votes? In, instead of swords, and what is a vote but a little piece of nonviolence? We live in a giant cathedral of nonviolence and all these votes, and yet when we get in trouble, and we all think that violence is sick in the household, between spouses, parents, and children, out in the streets, between nations, we all, first thing we do is to say we should stop the violence, and yet we'll turn around and say when we're really in trouble, what we need is violence, and we'll go to movies in which Bruce Willis gets dirtier and dirtier through the movie, and finally through some stupendous act of violence, he settles everything. We don't believe that's the way the world works. The civil rights movement taught that it's not the way the world works. The dirty secret is that a lot of people who were at the heart of the civil rights movement grew weary of nonviolence, even embarrassed by it. 
In some senses, Dr. King is unique in, in that respect because he grew more and more committed to nonviolence as a force for democracy and freedom and human rights, the more controversial it became. Within the last few months of his life, he stood before his staff and, and said he risked embarrassment by saying, I, if I'm the last person standing, I will say that nonviolence is the key to human rights. I, I, I Martin Luther King Jr., take the nonviolence to my wedded wife. It is our hope. It needs to be studied and debated more uh, in forums. Um, the United States is a leader in human rights, and yet we're also a leader in violence. And we don't really debate that very much. We don't debate our own prerogative that we are safe with the instruments of violence when others are not. We're not even interested to the degree I think we should be in the fate of the two nations in the world from World War II and the time of the Human De uh, Universal Declaration, Japan and Germany, whose constitutions by our authority proscribed militaries, how does that sit today with the German and Japanese people? There are little stories about it occasionally sprinkled in the New York Times as a quaint view of pacifism. But in many respects, it's a much more fundamental test than that. It's a test of to what degree the modern nation state should and can, and can get along without violence, major instruments of violence. So I encourage you. We need really to reestablish the sense of dealing with profound questions that hu human rights is a struggle, yes, but history is on your side as long as you, as you struggle and address the basic issues, the underlying issues of violence and power, the rights of children, the rights of optimism. Where does optimism come from? You know, you're talking about the, pre the, the preface to the, uh, to the Universal Declaration. Think of even the preface to the U.S. Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, uh, what, is, what else is it? <laughs> Ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Think of how optimistic that is. They're going to do all those things, and not just for them, and they haven't been done in 2,000 years. Our form of government rests on votes inherited by Martin Luther King, is a form of optimism that requires people to wrestle and look their fears right in their eyes the way freedom riders look Klansmen in the eyes. It is an intellectual, spiritual, moral task that if it gets too easy, we're probably not doing the right thing. Convenience is the enemy of human rights. Profundity, struggle, and optimism are our friends. I salute you for your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a few minutes, and I am reluctant to let this distinguished panel go uh, um, for questions. Um, you know, it is so important for us uh, to understand the history uh, that undergirds the human rights movement, the civil rights movement, and we have a treasure trove here um, in order for all of us to be looking ahead and charting the course for our future, we have to understand our history um, and it's the great optimism at its core. Um, so I, I, um, the floor is open for about five uh, minutes for questions. I'll call on you and you can direct them. I think, do you all have, you're all still mic'd, so that's great. Um, please. Uh, feel free to ask a question. Yes. That was great presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Steve Kleinman. I'm a career military intelligence officer, so perhaps this question seems kind of odd. Uh, the people on the other side of this debate, especially you so eloquently established where the, the, the line is, there, there are some brilliant people on the other side who just don't get it. I mean, they, they think violence still is the answer. And, and it's not like they were brought up in some circumstance or shaped by, by somebody to have that view, but they're all well-educated, the same place everybody else is educated. They have the same experiences, but yet they always 
resort to violence. And so what is it that drives them that gives us an idea of how to circumvent that? If you have can, I, can I take a stab at that? I was at the U.S. Institute of Peace two weeks ago taking a course on international humanitarian law. And I was the human rights voice in the room. And it was, the course was phenomenal. For me, it was getting my head to think, you know, shift gears and look at it in a different way. But even in an institution that is as phenomenal as the U.S. Institute of Peace, it was almost impossible to have a simultaneous conversation on human rights law and the rules of war at the same time. And so I think we've got to figure out a common vocabulary that will allow us to do that. The second thing is, um, I just want to use a 60 second example. The first panel today was astronomical, but we're preaching to the choir. We've got to figure out how to take those points, put them in accessible and relevant language, and get it into every high school, every community college, and every college in the United States. Because I work with teachers all over the world. I've trained 6,000 teachers in the United States on how to talk about the Declaration. And nobody knows how to do it. And until we figure out how to take the points that Taylor so eloquently made and put it in a way that keeps people at the table, we're going to still do it. Any other questions? Oh, yes, right here. Sunny. There's the mic. And introduce yourself. <laughs> Sunny Efren, now of Human Rights First. Um, I'd like to ask you to look forward to the Arab Spring, where some of the uh, propositions that you've spoken about so eloquently are being tested. And particularly, Dr. Branch, your um, the struggle between sort of um, optimism and realism in a place like Egypt, also Dr. Malik, where we're seeing um, protesters, you know, yet again in the third round being crushed on the streets, um, and whether freedom is going to win or, or lose, and what it would look like, what, 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 what our notion of freedom would be if it were fully expressed. Thank you. Well, I would only say very briefly, and then yield to Dr. Malik, because he's from that region of the world, and I'm strictly a tourist. Um, uh, hope is easier than change, and uh, the Arab String, it seems to me, um, uh, is ahead of uh, s some reform groups, but behind in the sense that I don't sense a, a, a dialogue about the place of religious pluralism and the place of violence within the movements themselves. Uh, absolutely, I would, I would agree with that. Unfortunately, after three years of upheavals in the region, the, the term Arab Spring has become um, a misnomer. Uh, it has, uh, I think, revealed for us much more the depth and complexity of the issues and problems rather than solving them or even um, suggesting solutions in, in that direction. Um, and specifically, we will deal with this in tomorrow's panel, the uh, religious pluralism issue um, and the place of religious freedom. In, a, in, the, in that setting. Um, you see, when we talk about human rights uh, and, and democracy and freedom, th these are not just um, political issues. And this, uh, I guess, in a, is sort of a response to the earlier question. These are philosophical questions. And their answers go beyond politics and enter the realm of the spirit and the mind. Why do people practice violence um, is, is a very uh, deep philosophical question at the end of the day. Uh, does it mean there is a flaw in human nature or does it mean uh, there is a persistent tendency to abuse human freedom? These are issues that can be debated, but notice the level of this debate is not just political, it's much deeper than that. Um, it, things are much more made much more complicated because in the Middle East you have several uh, world views, as it were that are not always on the same page. They're not always compatible. They, are, they overlap in some respects, and they conflict in others. And uh, uh, these, these views, whether they are expressed in terms of uh, sectarian plurality, clashing sectarian uh, sects, uh, or, uh, uh, or, or again, w whether it's a question of just opposing a, a, you know, a repressive dictatorship, 
they're not, they're, there's no magic wand that will solve things in two or three years that have festered for so long. So I've, I've tempered my expectations about the Arab Spring considerably since it started. And I, um, I'm learning to identify the problems much more than to see you know, actual solutions at this point. OK, one more question here I think we have time for. Good afternoon. I'm Frances Woodard, uh, soon to be with Human Rights First officially in a few weeks. Um, this question is for Dr. Black in particular. My sister is an educator in the Baltimore uh, public school system. Thank her for me. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. It, it, it's, it's a tough job. And uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday, we were having a conversation about how frustrated she is with the system in place when it comes to helping children to understand the history of where they've come from and where they are today. Uh, case in point, they were showing this civil rights um, eyes on the prize mm -hmm. video in her class, and the children were laughing. These are high schoolers. Yeah. They didn't understand the importance of it, the significance of it. They thought the images of people being attacked by dogs and hoses was humorous. What do you think needs to happen um, in our educational system in order to get young people more engaged in these issues and to understand the importance of where they've come from? Well, I can only tell you how I respond to that when that happens to me, is I've learned. I stop the tape. I take out a one-inch lead pipe wrapped in barbed wire. And I hand it, I put it right here. And I say, they got the crap beat out of them with this. You think that's funny? And it sort of sucks the oxygen out of the room. And, um, and so, what I ask them is what they would be willing to die for. I mean, that's the, um, I've, uh, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of um, not so smart things in my life, but, um, you know, for good reasons, but that really backfired. And um, the single best teaching tool I've ever found in situations like this regardless of what your faith is or whether you're like me, a gleeful agnostic, is that Eleanor carried a, a prayer in her wallet that she wrote out for 30 years until she died. And it's, Dear Lord, lest I continue in my complacent ways, help me to remember that somewhere someone died for me today. And if there be war, help me to remember to ask and to answer, am I worth dying for? And so I start a class with kids, asking them to close their eyes, not look at anybody around them, and in that little space in their gut where they only go when they're so secure that they can open all their fear, is to ask them what they would die for, and then work back from that. Did I answer your question? Yes, you need her. Quite, uh, quite her profoundly. <laughs> I, I think that was amazing. Thank you. Well, I think that's a, that's a question that we could all be asking ourselves and should be asking ourselves every day. And uh, please join me again in thanking this extraordinary panel. <laughs>